Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, there is a, a reason for the, the title of this talk, Conscious Capitalism. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and, and how that benefits people around the world, but also talk about the journey that I went through into how we ended up building this social enterprise. And if I start shaking, it's because I'm cold, because I've just motorbiked here from London. Um, and it was very foggy and wet when I left London this morning, so I'm just thawing out, and I uh, hope you bear with me. Um, which is actually part of how this started. Uh, my background was in advertising and marketing, and uh, at the ripe old age of 28, uh, I thought I knew it all and uh, had achieved everything in that previous career that I wanted to do. And I read a book that inspired me called Jupiter's Travels about a journalist who motorbiked out to Asia in 1970. And so with that book tucked under my arm, I bought a motorbike and put it on a plane to the east coast of Canada, having jokingly told all my colleagues at work that I was going to ride this motorbike around the world. Um, little did I know that actually I was going to end up doing that at the time. But it was really that journey that took me and, and immersed me into a lot of different cultures around the world and really opened my eyes to some of the challenges that people face. Um, so I, I rode across Canada and down through uh, the west coast of America into Mexico where I stopped for a cigarette I used to smoke in those days and was promptly shot at. Um, they have really tough anti-smoking laws in Baja, Mexico. <laughs> Um, and I rode down through, uh, through uh, Central America, down into South America, rode over the Andes in the middle of the night, which is something I wouldn't want to repeat, um, and all the way down to Chile. And I got down to southern Chile about 13 months after I left and thought, actually, this is quite a good, good fun. I'm going to carry on. So I put the motorbike on a plane to Australia, rode around Australia, uh, up through Indonesia, where I was in an earthquake five stories up in a building in the middle of the night. So it was very interesting to see what people wear when they go to bed as they're running down the corridors screaming and shouting. Um, and then rode, uh, took the bike into India, rode up through India all the way to, up to Amritsar on the Pakistan border, uh, rode down through Pakistan into an area called Baluchistan, which just borders uh, Afghanistan. It's quite close to the Helmand province that I'm sure everybody knows about. Um, I was there at a time that it wasn't particularly safe to be there and uh, was supposed to go through that part of the, the world with a military escort. Um, but having gone almost all the way around the world, I was quite cocky at that point too. So I signed a waiver saying if I got kidnapped that nobody was coming after me. Unfortunately, about a day later, I ended up in the front of a pickup truck thinking perhaps this was po possibly the stupidest thing that I'd ever signed. Um, but luckily, the police intervened, dragged me out of the truck and, and sent me on my way. And then I came back through the Middle East and that was pretty easy and, and arrived home. Um, and uh, to, to give you an idea about the, you know, what that kind of looks like, that's, that's obviously me on the, on, uh, with the motorbike. But if you thought I was bonkers for doing that on a motorbike, I bumped into this guy in a desert in Iran and he'd actually walked there from Japan. And if ever there was a sponsorship deal for Nike to be had, this guy must have been it. <laughs> so, uh, so, that, so that was my, my motorbike. But needless to say, two years on the road, uh, can, play, can play havoc with your, with your hair. And if ever there was a sponsorship deal for Timothée, I must have been it. Um, I'm just kidding. That was actually part of my previous life. I was doing an advertising campaign for T-Mobile, and they couldn't afford a model, so, uh, so they asked me to step in and put a wig and everything else on. I quite like it, actually, as a look, uh, particularly now. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but that, that time I had away was, was some of the best times that I had because it actually allowed my brain to switch off for two years and think about all the kind of things that were, that were interesting and important. Um, and particularly, um, that I ended up in Honduras in October 98 when Hurricane Mitch landed on top of Honduras. It was the second largest hurricane ever recorded in history and it decimated that country. It wiped out all the infrastructure, took out all the bridges, all the road networks, water, gas, electricity. It was Armageddon, for want of another, another uh, explanation. Um, and it was a really peculiar thing, because we live in you know, a society that doesn't really have to do with too many natural disasters. So I did what every normal British person would do, is I got up in the morning and went, crikey, what happened? Um, and then went off and bought some Mars bars and Pringles, um, because I thought that would keep me going. I had no concept of what was about to unfold, the fact that there would be no food, no water, no nothing. Um, and I spent some time in that community. There, there were some people that were killed, but most of it was to do with damage. And uh, I went down to, uh, to one particular area of the community that had been sort of washed away. There were some buildings still left standing. And was, was looking at this family standing outside this house, their house, and wondered why they weren't in there digging out all the, the slurry and the mud that had come through. And, and they had no tools. So I picked up a roof tile, and I said, come on, we'll, you know, we'll, just, we'll use roof tiles, and we'll dig the house out. And, uh, and obviously they thought I was completely mad, but within probably five or ten minutes, the rest of the community had all picked up a roof tile too, and at the end of that day, 
we'd actually dug one house out of the mud using roof tiles. And I think it was a, an amazing experience in terms of when you bring people together, actually what you can achieve. And, and that for me is really the second part of this journey about what we've done today. So um, when I came back, I went back into the advertising marketing industry, which I loved. I've always loved that. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic sector to be in. Um, but I was drunk in a pub one day um, with some marketing friends, and one of them happened to mention that there were a billion people in the world that didn't have access to clean water. And he said, we're all marketeers or finance people. Why don't we create a uh, bottled water company and give all the profits away? And um, everybody was, you know, had too much beer and thought this was a wonderful idea. And actually, being a bunch of creative marketeers, we all said, well, if we could do a kind of water-for-water water thing, perhaps we could look at other things too. Perhaps we could create a credit card that would fund microfinance. Perhaps we could create HIV products that would fund HIV AIDS programs and things like that. But it was really this photograph that kind of kicked me into action. For me, it was, it was the equivalent of that Vietnam-era photograph of the young girl running down the street. I'm sure everybody remembers that. Um, and I'd seen this on my travels around the world. I'd seen, I had to actually smuggle water in Honduras out of an American military camp. That's how valuable a bottle of clean water was in, a, in an area that didn't have clean water. So I understood this, and it kind of spurred me into action. So I started using all the resources of the big advertising agency that I was at, looking into all the data about the bottled water markets, 1.5 billion pound markets dominated by two or three companies. Um, there's room there to put an ethical water brand in, or, or so I thought. Um, and, and really, it was, there are two, two photographs that I'm sure everybody, and, and two phrases that everybody knows, one of which was you know, Martin Luther King's, you know, I have a dream statement. Um, and the other one was JFK. Two things he said, actually. One of which was about having a goal, and the other one which was about doing things because they were difficult, not because they're easy. You know, we choose to do things because they're difficult. I could have come on the train from London this morning. Very easy. Actually, I thought I'd give myself a bit of pain, see if I could make my backside go numb after three hours down the M4 and, and freeze to death on the way. But I did it for a reason, because actually I wanted to switch my brain off for three hours. I wanted just to come here completely divorced of emails and phone calls and everything else and just talk to you about the kind of stuff that we're doing. So we, we had this dream, which was to go and affect change in the world, to go and try and change, um, uh, simply change people's lives in a really, really simple, uh, simple, easy way. But for me, it was about changing one, because I wasn't even sure that I could create a bottled water company. I wasn't sure that I could, I could do that. I didn't have any resources. I certainly didn't have a grant from any kind of social enterprise loan providing company or funding or anything else. I used my own life savings to start this up. And then when I'd gone through that, I remortgaged my house. And when I'd gone through that, I had a friend of mine paying off what was left of my mortgage and I was living off handouts of my parents. And I think that for me is how you start a business, whether it's a social business or, 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 or anything else. It's about putting yourself into that area of pain and saying, if I'm going to succeed, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it on my terms. Um, but I just wanted to change, um, change one person's life. And there were really a couple of things that started to interest me about this, which was I started to look at some data, and this is, this is a more up-to-date version of it. This was published in April this year, which is, says that half of the UK adults view environmental and issues, uh, environmental and ethical issues as important, but they don't want to do it for themselves. Yeah. Everybody will recycle if you make it easy. Everybody will buy products that do some good if you can make it easy and if they cost the same amount. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is if you do it, if you provide people with a mechanism to do something good, actually most people will do it. And this is underlined by some research that we did for ourselves, which is that, when f that we did some research and consumers said 54% of people said that they would buy this bottle of water over a bottle of water from Evian or Volvic or Danone or somebody like that, um, assuming all things are equal. I'm proud to say this is Welsh water, so everybody in this room <laughs> should be buying this brand over any other brand that, uh, that comes out of this region. Um, but the starting point really for us was, was about trying to get this going. So we said we are going to give away 100% of the profits that we make from the sales of One Water to funding clean water projects. Now, there's nothing new. This has been replicated a few times over the last couple of years. But something that is different for me is the power of what we do and the speed in which we can do it. So a few months ago, stuff started to crop off on the news about East Africa and what was happening in Somalia and all the refugees. I took a phone call on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. By about 10 o'clock, 
in the morning, I was talking to British Airways about what they were doing and how they were getting involved. By the end of the day, I'd amassed a few people together, and we said, actually, we want to be part of this. We want to go and do something. Within four days, we deployed over a million pounds into that region to fund water projects. Four days. And we're a tiny, tiny little company of 15 people based in an office in London competing against the likes of Highland Spring, Evian, Volvic, and everybody else. So if we can do that, you imagine what some of these big brands and big companies can do. And actually, the thing that that did was it kept a quarter of a million people alive. Yeah. There were people that had walked for days, 10 days, dying en route because of lack of access to clean drinking water. 250,000 people kept alive by a bottle of water bought by consumers in this country. I think that's pretty amazing. So the thing for me was, if we, can, if we can start to do these kind of things, how else can we extend it? What else can we do? If we go back to this pub conversation about if we can do water for water, what else is it that we can do? So in the UK, we buy over half a billion pounds worth of flavoured waters, vitamin waters, things like that. I'm sure everybody knows glass air water. That's the big one. Sobe, I think people are seeing. Yeah, we produce one called one vitamin water. And on that like-for-like -like basis, the water-for-water -water concept, we use all the money that we make from that to go and fund vitamins in the form of vegetable gardens. Very simple concept, everyday product that consumers can buy. Sanitation. We buy over a billion pounds worth of loo roll every year in this country. A billion pounds worth of loo roll. It's a lot of loo roll. Um, we produced a, uh, a brand of toilet tissue produced in Port Talbot, actually, just down the road from here by Intertissue. So thank you very much for the, uh, for the Welsh contingent on that, water and loo roll. Um, and we use all the profits that we, we, uh, we make from that to fund sanitation and, uh, and hygiene programs. And having been over to Africa and seen where children have fallen down into cesspits because the ground crumbles beneath their feet, having gone to schools where 50% of kids don't go to school because there's no toilet, because the alternative is to go and pee and defecate in the bushes and risk standing on other kids' excretions and, and uh, you know, being bitten by snakes is just a horrific uh, you know, alternative. Um, but this one was, was quite interesting. If I go back to that kind of bringing the community together thing, um, about a year ago, we decided, in, in conjunction with the co-op, um, to try and create a program where we would actually open up the one brand to the public, um, to school children, to businesses, to everybody else, and say, look, we're a bunch of marketeers, but actually I don't believe that this is something that we should just develop on our own. I think there's an amazing opportunity for people to come up with similar like-for-like -like concepts. So we opened it up to the masses, and we did it in Social Enterprise Week a couple of years ago. And it was actually a bunch of school kids that came up with this idea. And they wanted to come up with a range of Band-Aids, Elastoplast, and use it to fund bicycle ambulances. And that's what we now do. And when, when this kind of came to me, and, and the judging panel, um, of which Doug Richards, one of the Dragon's Den guys, was involved as well, and we kind of looked at it and we went, plasters, not really sure about plasters, certainly not sure about bicycle ambulances. You know, why on earth would anybody want a bicycle ambulance in a community, which effectively is you know, a stretcher? being towed behind a bicycle. I was fortunate enough to go to Malawi in the spring of this year, and I went to a community that had one of these. And the nearest clinic for them was 24 kilometers away. There was no public transport, and the only way of getting people to that clinic was walking, or literally having two big blokes stand with somebody sat on a bicycle and wheeled for 24 kilometers. Now, I reckon half the, women in here, half the people in here are women. Probably a big bunch of you have, uh, have got children. Can you imagine being in labor and getting complications and then saying, do you know what, sit on this bicycle for a couple of hours while we push you to the nearest clinic? Or face the alternative and probably risk death in the community. You know, it's such a simple thing. It's so cheap and it's funded by something that is uh, something that everybody buys in this country. We started looking at how to actually build this faster, because I'm, I'm a very impatient person. That's why I, why I ride motorbikes. Can't wait for public transport. Um, but we started looking at how do we do this bigger and how do we do this faster. So we actually said, what we're going to start doing is licensing the brand to people. Yeah, we're not going to manufacture it ourselves. We're actually going to license the brand to people. So just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we launched a range of porridge um, and biscuits. Um, the porridge is done with Europe's largest porridge manufacturer. 
largest porridge manufacturer in Europe. And this porridge, uh, and it's a range of box and bags and tubs and everything else, it's just gone into national distribution in Tesco's. It's going to be rolled out into all the other big, uh, big retailers over the next few weeks as well. Um, and they loved it. Because what we do is we take the money that we make from that and we go and fund infant feeding programs in schools. Because that actually gives kids a reason to go to a school in a developing country. Because most kids, bizarrely, don't get fed. You know, they walk for hours to go to school. They're tired, they're hungry, they don't have access to, to clean water, sanitation, school meals. And actually by putting in water and sanitation and now giving them a, a, a porridge meal, a maize meal, actually they go to school. They're better hydrated, they learn better, they have a better shot at, at getting a, you know, a, a good start in life. Um, but there are two things that, that particularly interest me, because this is kind of social enterprise sort of upside down or reversed in some way, which is that we saw an opportunity to, to bring eggs into uh, the UK market. Um, and we did it, we've done it with actually the biggest egg company in the UK, Noble Foods, who have about 65% market share in the UK. You probably know the Happy Egg brand, which is what they're very, very well known for. And they, and we were in discussions, and they absolutely loved what, what we were doing, and they said, perhaps we can help you, you know, take on a, a new brand into a new sector. So we launched um, eggs earlier this year, um, and available in, in most retailers. But the thing that I particularly liked about this is, this is about starting up businesses in developing countries. Because the money that we make from this, we use to fund startup chicken farming businesses in developing countries. So essentially, it's about providing somebody not with a hand out, but a hand up. So to give you an idea, for those people that are lucky enough to be on a 50,000 pound salary, if I gave you this project, actually it would turn you into a, having a million pound salary overnight. That's how dramatic that life changing. Uh, changing effect is of, of just having some chickens. So it's a huge change, um, and we've just managed to replicate that um, only in the last couple of weeks by launching uh, bread, done with one of the biggest regional bakeries in this country. And this has gone out into, again, most of the big retailers, and we're using all the revenue that we take from that to fund micro bakeries. Yeah. This is about targeting people who are in extreme poverty and seeing we're going to help you build a business. We might help you build a chicken farming business. We might help you build a bakery business. My ambition is that we become the next Greggs of Africa. Can you imagine that? Um, but it's amazing to see how little things actually change stuff in, in, in a massive way. So that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. We've been, we've been quite busy. Um, and we've, we've had an amazing um, good fortune to start to amass consumers on Facebook. Um, when we started Facebook, we weren't quite sure what we were doing with it. So we thought, we'll just try it. We'll put out there what we think is a good idea, and we'll, you know, is this crowdsourcing or whatever else. Within a couple of weeks, we had 237,000 people join us on Facebook. That's bigger than most brands. That's bigger than the Innocents. It's certainly not as big as Coke, but, but it's something that has resonated with people. People are saying, this is a great idea. This is, I'm happy to switch. As long as your pricing is the same, as long as the quality is the same, as long as I can find it, I'm going to buy your products over and above um, anything else that I'll do. Um, and the important thing is, is, how do you find these kind of win-wins? Because this is all good for us. But actually, I need to find a win-win for the retailers. So we kind of looked at, with Ron Retailer, um, the bottled water category. They're a 28 million pound bottled water category in one retailer in this country. And we said to them, actually, if we start to put these other products in your supermarket, can we see if we can start to migrate consumers from one category to another category? And the interesting thing about bottled water in, in this particular retailer is it grew 4% last year because 150,000 new people walked into that category and started buying bottled water. 150,000 people. Well, to give you an idea, between those four products that we've got, we've got somewhere close to 12 or 13 million potential customers that are sitting in that store that aren't buying bottled water. So you've got to say, isn't this a great idea for you, Mr. Big Retailer, that if you can get consumers, 54% of consumers say, I love this brand. 237,000 people follow us on Facebook. We've got loads of products that are going into your store. Wouldn't you love to have water available in this store? We had a phone call last night saying, love everything you're doing but your commercial proposal isn't enough. And I think that's really sad, because three or four months ago, the same retailer came to us and said, really love what you're doing, 
you know, numbers stack up, we've got the right margin, we've got the right opportunity, love all of that, but actually we need £22,000 worth of free stock. And I'm like, okay, you know, we can work that into the commercials. Social enterprise is not about charity, it's about being a business. If it takes £22,000 to put this product into this retailer, then we'll find a way to do it. And we did. And we, had, we got a phone call two days ago saying, we want you to come back and repitch this. Didn't win the business. Even after putting £22,000 on the table. So I think it's sad. But my prediction is it'll change. Because I think this brand is set to grow in a way that people won't be able to afford to turn it down. I think it will grow and continue to grow, and that's what I'm looking for. Because more people buy ethical products in this country than other brands. Yeah, once somebody buys into it, whether it's fair trade or one or anything else, people go, I like that, I'm going to continue buying that, I'm loyal to that. And actually, they spend more money. So consumers who buy this product in retailers spend close to £1,000 a year on more products than a normal consumer. So you've got to say, that's great. That's what this is about. Um, and that's kind of the full range, really, um, in terms of where we are today. We're just about to launch another few products. We've got some amazing opportunities for, for things that are coming out. Um, and over the last few years, we've given away £7.6 million without having any funding, any startup funding. And just by bashing our head against the wall and saying, do you know what? We're going to do the difficult things. We're going to do things that are hard to do because it's the right thing to do. And the right thing to do ultimately impacts on 1.9 million people over a couple of years. So I'm really excited about what we've done. There are plenty of bumps in the road. We just have to get over them and keep going. Because what we're about to do is going to get really exciting over the next five years. We've started in consumer goods and FMCG products. We're just about to move into financial services. We've started discussions in the technology sector. And we're starting to look at healthcare. This brand is going to extend and extend and extend. Next there we are, six billion of us all looking to live, love, thrive and survive. For most of us, a drink of clean water, something to eat and good sanitation are just a matter of turning on a tap, buying some food or flushing the loo. But for some people in Africa, it can be a matter of life or death. So the people at one thought, wouldn't it be great if the people with stuff could give the same life-saving something to someone in Africa just by saying, mm, one of those please. Welcome to the world of one, where you can do one good thing just by buying one good thing. And hopefully that's a pretty simple explanation of what it is that we do. So all I ask of you is to follow us, to tweet about us, to share that experience, to become a fan, to become part of our world. And every time you see the one brand, go and buy it. Thank you very much.